child. And uh, it's just a nice version that gets us in the mood, I think, for a nice relaxing night. And uh, everyone doing good this evening? Isn't it exciting what's going on in the world today? I mean, I'll tell you, you know, we look at the Republicans and the Democrats and what's going on in our nation. That's exciting, not as exciting as what God is doing as we're going to see during the conference coming up, which is less than two weeks away. But it's, is it less than two weeks away? About that, yep. Let me see, July 31st, what? A week and a half, yep. And July 26th is Suzanne Tavaugh's birthday. Thank you. And Robert's going to buy you a special surprise. I talked to him before service. We can't tell anybody what it is, though. Anyway, <clears throat> it's great to have the opportunity to be with the royal family during this time coming up. But, you know, what's really, really uh, disturbing to me is not so much the Democrats and the Republicans and the politicians, but it's really the fourth estate, the media. I cannot believe how the media is just kind of using, I mean, you turn on the media, you turn on two stations, you swear we are in two different countries at two different times in two different generations. One's reporting one thing, one's reporting the other. And the issue is who are people going to listen to? And uh, thank God that the, that the uh, pivot of the United States found in the United States of America, the pivot of believers, because we don't really, I mean, we, I know that we need to make America great again, but America is still great. It's still the greatest country in the world. So we don't need to make America great. What we really need is to make Americans realize how great we really already are. And then when we realize that, then we can focus in on the main responsibility, which is in the spiritual realm as believer priest, which is to grow in God's grace and knowledge. And just like Sodom and Gomorrah could have been spared for 10, if there were 10 righteous people, our nation can be spared if individuals just take their calling seriously, as Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. So with all that in mind, this is our introduction to this evening's message. And again, I said we are looking forward to the 2016 New England Bible Conference, and it's beginning July 31st all the way to August 7th. The Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn in the word of truth this evening to Genesis chapter uh, 12. Genesis the 12th chapter. I was watching a movie last night, no, it was the night before, and it was around 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning when I heard this statement, and uh, actually I really enjoyed it. It wasn't a movie, it was one of the, I think it was called Blue Bloods, is that the one about the, uh, the, the guy who's the commissioner of New York City Police Department? Someone made this statement, and it, it was so good, I liked it so much I got up and I made sure that I wrote it down. But here's the statement, do not always go where the path may lead, Go where there is no path and leave a path yourself. Think about that. Do not always go where the path may lead. In other words, following the majority. Go where there is no path. Don't be afraid to go forward in places you've never been before. Go where there is no path and leave a path yourself. Paul said, become an example. He said that in Philippians chapter 3. He said, look at my life and become an example of that which I have become an example of, which is the fact that he follows, uh, followed in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I like that statement because it tells us to go forward in God's plan, no matter what the majority may see, be, seem to say, because as the Bible teaches, most of the time, the majority, the majority of the time, the majority is always wrong. We know that because Satan deceives the who? The whole what? The whole world. And he deceives the majority. Thank God for those of us who do not fall into that trap and realize that we are here to bring glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because we are ambassadors, representative, represent, representatives of the heavenly city we have been sent from, which of course is that new Jerusalem in the place that God has designed for us to live in forever and ever. 
Let's do what we normally do, which is to take a moment of silent prayer to get rid of any of the problems that you may have on your mind, any of the difficulties that you may be focusing in. Maybe you have failed in some area and you want to confess your known sin, which is what the Apostle John said to believers, that if we do confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is the time where we can be totally under the control of God the Holy Spirit who is your true mentor. Not me, but the Holy Spirit is the true mentor that God has given all of us to grow in his grace and knowledge. With that in mind, a moment of silent prayer is now in view for you to say it, name and cite any known sins if you have any, and also ask God to take away any distractions that may hinder your intake of Bible doctrine. Let us pray. Father, we could never, ever understand how gracious you really are. Even in eternity, we'll still be learning more and more about your grace. We are overwhelmed by the fact that in your grace and in your mercy, you forgive us in your mercy for our past, and you give us grace for the future. We are overwhelmed by your love for all of us, and we thank you that we can come before the throne of grace this evening and that God the Holy Spirit can enlighten us with the information we are about to note. May your blessing be upon the speaker this evening, and may you control the information that goes forward, and may we all have a sense of objectivity and not subjectivity as we concentrate on who and what you are rather than who and what we are. Challenge us this evening through the communication of Bible doctrine. We ask these things in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Based upon his merits, we do pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 12, we are now noting, believe it or not, under the father of our faith, we are noting the failures of Abraham in this dispensation of promise. Now remember, we're studying the doctrine of dispensations, but I'm not just going to stay with the subject of dispensations only. We have to find out what really took place in all those dispensations. And there's one major lesson that we have learned so far in the first four dispensations. Like all dispensations, no matter what the Lord does for his people, no matter what the Lord does, mankind always seems to find a way to reject and rebel against God's plan for that dispensation. And therefore, it doesn't matter what God does. In fact, when we're through with all the dispensations, we will have one major uh, principle that we're going to see, that in every dispensation, what God did, mankind failed, because mankind inevitably, without a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, has no way to appreciate all it is that God has done for him. And so far, we have seen, for example, when it comes to the life of Abraham, that we will recap his life as the father of our faith, and we're going to see what a great man of God he really was. But we've, so far, we have seen certain principles when it comes to the life of Abraham, and especially when it comes to his failures. For example, we've already seen him, Abraham, refusing to separate from his father, Terah. You know that already. We study that in some detail. Then we saw after he refused to separate from his father, we saw him going in the wrong direction. He started going in the direction of Haran and then Negev, not the direction of Canaan. Thirdly, we also saw him refusing to separate from his nephew Lot and also Mrs. Lot, his wife. Then number four, we see Abraham leaving the promised land, as we saw on Sunday morning, the promised land of Canaan and going down to Egypt, which represents the dog returning to his vomit and going down to the ways of the world. But we're still not finished. Number five, we see Abraham living in fear. He lived in so much fear that he would be killed by the Pharaoh of Egypt. Fear is a sin. When we live in fear, we are afraid. We're saying that we don't trust that God will come through for us as he always does. Whatever is not of faith is what? It's sin. And therefore, when we live in fear or worry, we are living in sin. It happened to Abraham, and he represents the best of the human race at that time. Number six, then we saw him failing, lying to the Pharaoh of Egypt. He's going to lie to the Pharaoh of Egypt. We closed with that on Sunday morning. Number seven, we saw him doing that when he asked his wife Sarah to lie to protect him. 
Instead of doing what he should have done, which was to actually stand up for Sarah, he's asking Sarah, or at the time Sarai, to lie and protect him. Then number eight, we saw him refusing to protect his wife, and he was the head of the household. Now here's a man who's called the father of our faith. What do we do? Do we condemn him for that, or do we learn from that? We learned from that. That's why these things were written for our examples in, in Romans 15, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. So we begin this evening, look at verse 4 of Genesis 12. This is after the promises were given in verses 1 through 3. So Abram went forth, really Abraham is in view, he went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he had departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, he took Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and he took the slaves which they had acquired in Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan, the promised land. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Now in order to understand the spiritual significance behind this passage, you need to note the principle of what we call typology. Remember, if you're a believer, the Bible never says that as a believer you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. It never says that. Don't take scripture out of context. The Bible says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples, and then, and only then, will you know the truth and the truth will set you free. What is your role? What is my role? Doing what? Continuing in the word. If we don't continue in the word, we're not going to know the truth. And the truth is not going to set us free. And you're not going to continue in the word by staying home when the word of God is especially being spoken by whomever is your pastor teacher. And so therefore we begin with a disciple's request. What do I mean when we talk about the fact that in order to understand the spiritual significance of this passage, we need to understand the principle of typology. First of all, let me give you a definition of typology. Typology, for those of you who consider yourself to be mathates, which is where we get the word mathematician from, which means students of the Word of God. Typology is the study of the Word of God as it relates to the subjects mentioned, which have a secondary meaning. In other words, the subject has a meaning, but it also has a secondary meaning. That's what typology is all about. When it talks about a place like Haran, the place is a literal place. That's, the, that's what the Word of God teaches. It is a place that is literal, but it represents something. That's where typology comes in. It's the study of the Word of God as it relates to the subjects mentioned, which have a secondary meaning. And uh, when we look at typology, I want you to think about it like this. It's almost like I, I laughed when I wrote this definition up because it reminded me of my, uh, my early grades in, when I was in grammar school, one of the definitions of a noun. But Typology views people, places, and things having a spiritual significance and meaning behind what is being said. You see that? Again, typology views the people. People's names mean something. They may not mean that much today, but when the Bible was originally written, written by Moses, who, by the way, who passed that down, when the Bible views certain people in their names, certain places in their names and certain things, there's a spiritual significance and a, be, a meaning behind what is being said. Under the principle of typology, therefore, certain places in the Word of God refer to more than the, just the place that is being mentioned. The place or the persons or things being mentioned have a spiritual meaning or application to our life behind them. For example, let me take the word uh, Canaan, the land of Canaan. Now that is a literal land. Land. It represents the promised land. God promised Abraham that he was going to give him a land. And by the way, Abraham died without ever seeing the promise fulfilled. I'm going to show you something very interesting that I think a lot of us don't understand. A lot of things that God promised to Abraham, he died without them being fulfilled in his lifetime. He had to trust that someday they were going to be fulfilled at another time. But he died without receiving the promises being fulfilled by sight. The land of Canaan, for example, represents the promised land. That has never, ever been given to the Jewish people like it's going to be given, as the Word of God states. It also, now under typology, Canaan represents the place of fellowship. 
It represents the place of learning doctrine. It represents the place of testing because there were giants in the land of Canaan or people that were going to be used to test Abraham and his family. It represents the place of blessing, the place of the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. So every time we see the word Canaan, we don't just say, oh yeah, I know Canaan, that's like Mexico or that's like the United States of America or that's like, you know, Nevada or a city, that's like New York City or San Francisco. No. It represents something. Number one, it represents the promised land. It represents the place where we can have fellowship, where we can learn doctrine, where we are going to be tested. The place of blessing, God is going to bless us, and the place where we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, follow this, when a passage mentions the name of a place, it has a reason for doing so. There's a reason behind it, especially under what we call the first mention principle. You know, I was thinking about calling uh, Pastor Sykes to invite him to our, our con to uh, invite him to our conference. Then I forgot that he went home to be with the Lord. And I said, you know what? That's what it's like when we're ch children of God, because even though they're not here presently in time, they're still in our hearts in eternity, aren't they? They're still alive. Ray Almeida's senior is still alive. We're sitting in his chapel. Chapel. He's still alive right now. And God only knows if whether or not Ray is observing tonight's uh, service. He could. I have no idea what happens in heaven, nor do you. All I know is that God is gracious, and God is a God of love. He's also a God that has a sense of humor, doesn't he? How do you know God had a sense of humor? I'll tell you how. Who created a sense of humor? God, not Satan. Who created laughter? God. Who created jokes? God. When they're pure, of course. I'm not talking about, you know, X-rated jokes. But the point is, God is under control. So for the first time, think about the fact that we can see things in the Word of God that we could not see in the past because we live not in the sense of living for time only, but living for eternity. That's how Abraham... Isaac and Jacob and most of the Old Testament saints actually lived. So when a passage mentions the name of a place, it has a reason for doing so. And under the first mention principle, that Pastor Sykes taught me this, by the way, that's why I said that, when the first time a word is mentioned, it usually carries that meaning of throughout the Word of God. It usually ca uh, carries that same meaning of the word. So every time we see the word serpent, where's the first time we saw the serpent? in the Garden of Eden. What was he? A crafty one, a deceitful one. And most of the time when we see the word serpent, it refers to those who are crafty and deceitful. So much so that even in Revelation 12, 9, Satan is called the serpent who is called the what? The devil. The devil is not his name. The devil is his title. It's an accusation. So that we read, look at Genesis 12, 6 again. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, now, why is Shechem mentioned? To the Oak of Morah. What's the Oak of Morah? Now, the Canaanite was there in the land. Now, I want you to see that there are three things mentioned in this verse. The site of Shechem, the Oak of Morah, and the Canaanite. All these have a spiritual significance concerning what is being mentioned. I'll say this on Sunday morning, many of you will know what Shechem represents, what the Oak of Morah represents, and what the Canaanite represents. Many will not. What determines whether or not you'll know that or not? It determines that based upon the fact of what were you doing when your pastor teacher taught you these principles. Were you too busy, wrapped up in the cosmic system, the devil's world, that you did not have enough time to pay attention? Did you totally ignore it because you were apathetic or indifferent? Did you hate what he taught because he challenged you? And have I become your enemy simply because I tell you the truth? Well, I'm going to keep on telling you the truth, and if I become your enemy, so be it. All I know, this is my job. And when it says Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the Oak of Morah, and the Canaan was there in the land, there are three things we have to understand. What does Shechem represent under typology? What is the Oak of Morah? And what does the Canaanite represent? All these have a spiritual significance concerning what is being mentioned? Shechem. Let's take that as an illustration. Shechem is a city that's found in Canaan. And it's the promised land. Remember, Canaan is the promised land. Shechem is one of the cities. 
Shechem actually means a shoulder or a ridge. And under typology, if you look that up, if you look it up under any form of typology in the Word of God, you can even do a search online, you'll see that it represents an advance in the spiritual life. So when it says that uh, Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, he came to the place where he was advancing in the spiritual life. And that's what a ridge refers to. A ridge or a shoulder refers to something that you place something upon. A she Shechem is first mentioned here because this passage is connecting Abraham's journey with the land of promise. And so when it says Abraham passed through that land, Shechem says that he was on the right road. He's on the right path. He is advancing. He's got, the, he's got not the weight of the world upon his shoulder. He's got the grace of God and the power of God on his shoulder. But then it says he, went, he also went to the Oak of Marah. What is the Oak of Marah? I could skip over this and just keep on reading, but my job is to communicate these things, is to study these things. The Oak of Marah, or Mora, in Genesis 12, 6, represents the, the place of strong and mighty teachers. Teaching. It's, in the pa it's in the promised land. There is a place in the promised land. The promised land for us, by the way, in our day and age is the pre-designed plan of God. This is the promised land when we live in God's plan. So this represents a place of strong and mighty teaching. It indicates a place where Abraham was taught the word of God. So the oak tree at Shechem was the first place. Think about this. The oak tree at Shechem was the first place that Abraham stopped when he first entered into Canaan, the promised land. In other words, he continued even learning the basic doctrines and the advanced doctrines when he entered into the promised land. So all these definitions fall under the principle of typology. Again, verse 6, he passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, that means advancing in the spiritual life, to the oak of Morah, the place of advanced doctrine in the promised land. And then it says, notice next, why does it say, now the Canaanite was then in the land? What does that last phrase mean? Are we going to overlook it? Why does it say the Canaanite was in that land? I'll tell you why. The Canaanite, under typology, represents, they were a demon culture. They represent a demon culture. They represent a type of the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness under the control of the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, who's the God of this world? Satan. Ephesians 2, 2. He's the prince in the power of the air. So under the doctrine of typology, it tells us even this. Even when you're in the promised land, okay, follow me. If you're in the promised land and you're going forward in God's plan, does that mean you're going to be without demonic interference? Not at all. Why? Because the Canaanites are going to be in the promised land. There's going to be opposition. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age. So just because you are in the right place doing the right thing, that doesn't mean you're not going to face problems, does it? Now that falls under typology. I wonder how many of you understood that without a pastor teacher teaching you that. Maybe you understood it in the past because someone taught you that, but someone has to teach you these things or you miss out on why these things were written. Every word of God is inspired of God. All scripture is God what? Breathes. God's breath is found in every scripture. It may not make sense to us, but when we dig deep, and as we dig deeper and deeper, as we get older and older and go forward in the plan of God, we're going to see these things have a lot of meaning. So let me just give you a quick illustration of what we have here. Under the doctrine of typology, let me put the whole verse together. And Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem. He advanced in the spiritual life. He's in the promised land. He's going as far. On the way to the promised land, he's going as far as the site of Shechem, advancing in the spiritual life. To the Oak of Morah, advanced doctrine in the promised land of Canaan. And now the Canaanite, the enemy of Ephesians 6.12, was then in the land. So notice that even in the promised land, there is demonic opposition. Now in response to what Abraham is facing, he's been learning doctrine. Amen? He's been advancing. Amen? And now he recognizes that there's an enemy in the promised land. Can you say amen? amen. All right. What happens? Look at verse 7. 
In response, Abraham now builds an altar to the Lord in Canaan at Shechem. We read, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Now the Lord is speaking to him because they're on speaking terms. He's got positive volition. To your descendants, I will give this land. Abraham never saw that, by the way. But he's still the father of our faith. To your descendants, I will give this land. What does Abraham do? He built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. Now, Sunday morning, I showed you, I told you, the altar, the building of the altar, altar represents the edification complex of your soul. You're building an edifice right now. You're building a soul structure. In your soul, you have floors. You have a first floor, a second floor, a third floor. The more floors you have, the more you advance in the spiritual life. So you're building an altar in your very own soul. Some of you just have a foundation. That's all you have. Most Christians, that's all they have. Some of you have the first floor, the basic doctrine. Some of you may have the second floor, maybe spiritual self-esteem. The third floor, spiritual autonomy or independence where you don't lean on others. The fourth floor, spiritual maturity, and then all the blessings that follow that. But notice what it says, the Lord appeared to him and he said to your descendants, I'm going to give the land. Abram's response, he built an altar there to the Lord and who had appeared to him. Then, notice what happens now, he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of what? Bethel. Now, if you were studying the word of God under typology, where should you stop? Right there, Bethel. What does Bethel represent? Under typology, Bethel represents the place of worship, the place of receiving doctrine and growing in God's grace and knowledge. And it says that, notice what he did. He, he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, and then he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, and notice next, Ai on the east. We have to stop at AI under typology. AI represents the place of ruin and a type of the cosmic system. Notice what, what we have. He has a place where he's worshiping God, a choice to make, or a place where the cosmic system is inviting him back. So you have Bethel representing the house of God. In fact, if we did more of that, we see that even the Lord, Jesus Christ, is said to come out from the house of Bethel, the house of God. We have Bethel, the house of God, and it's an altar in your soul. It represents per, uh, perception, metabolization, and application of Bible doctrine. And then we have AI, the cosmic system. Why is that important? The spiritual lesson is this. You're either going to choose to live in the Bethel place, the place where you're worshiping God, the place where your altar is being built, or you're going to end up choosing AI, the cosmic system. What did Moses say? I set before you life and death. Choose life that you may be, uh, that you may be saved or that you may be blessed and that you may be go forward in God's plan so that you may live and prosper. What did he say? I set before you life and death. The life, the house of Bethel, the death, AI. Now, you don't get that from reading the English, do you? You get that from revealing to yourself that you need a communicator of doctrine to bring these things up. And then whether you agree with it or not, that's not my problem. That depends upon you and the Lord. You have every right to either accept what I say or reject what I say, but that's between you and the Lord. The choice is what you are dependent upon. What is your mental attitude? Is it toward the word of God, or are you going to be conformed to AI, the cosmic system? So he proceeded from there to the mountain of the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. And notice he pitched his tent because he's resting He's at a place where he's going to say, all right, I've got to make a decision now. I'm not going to rush into it. Someone asked me just recently about something that's very personal. I don't want to really get into the details, but they were about to make a very serious decision in their life. And one of the things I said, God is not the author of confusion. And before you make that decision, you need to pitch your tent. What does that mean? Just sit back for a moment, relax. And let God speak to you. Don't rush into that decision, especially when it's a major decision. Pitch your tent, and hopefully you'll, build, you'll be at that place that it says in verse uh, 8, when it says that he went to Bethel, on, Bethel was on the west and Ai on the east. Hopefully you choose Bethel, the place where the altar of the Lord is being magnified. However, for Abraham, 
This did not last too long, staying in that particular place, because he's now going to rush into a decision, and verse 9 brings up the decision that we saw on Sunday morning, but this is not repetition, this is more addition to what we noted. Abram journeyed on. Notice the phrase, he what? Journeyed what? He journeyed on, continuing toward the Nagiv. Typology, Nagiv. What does it represent? Neglect of doctrine. And therefore we are now ready for the more subtle attack, Genesis 12, 10 through 20. And this, hits, this, hit, uh, this really hits much closer to home to you and I because you see, Satan, uh, Satan's attack proceeds now through the lack of confidence in the promises of God to Abraham and his tendency toward backsliding spiritually. Notice what I just said. Right now, Abraham is about to begin to lack some confidence in the promises of God. He hasn't seen the promises of God being fulfilled, as God said, as of yet by sight. He hasn't seen the land being delivered over to his descendant, to his uh, children. He hasn't seen Isaac, the promised son. And so Satan's attack now proceeds on Abraham. And now through the lack of confidence in the promises of God to Abraham and his tendency toward backsliding spiritually, we now have what we saw in Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 10. Here's where Abraham now begins to make a great major mistake in his life. It says, there was a famine in the land. Now, the famine in the land at this, this time, remember, is he in the promised land? No. He's out of the promised land. What kind of famine will you have in the promised land? Remember, there's a famine not only in the natural realm, but in Amos 5, I believe it's verse 8, there'll be a famine of the teaching of the Word of God. So now there's a famine, both spiritually and naturally. It says there was a famine in the land, both spiritually and naturally. So Abram, what does he do now? Does he go back to the promised land? Not at all. And Abraham went down to where? Egypt. To sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Under a typology, of course, Egypt represents the place of total rejection of the word of God. Neglect of doctrine, the Negev typology, always leads to the rejection of doctrine, Egypt, referring to the cosmic system. In fact, Egypt is one of the places that Abraham digressed to. That even up until this day, to this day, some of his descendants are still reaping the consequences of his negative decisions. Because there, Abraham only compounds and intensifies his problems. Going down to Egypt is a type of the devil's world. It's the cosmic system. It never solves anything. It may be better for you. You may prosper more. You might have a lot more money. And you say, you know what? I'm going in the ways of the world. You may do so but well, you're not going to prosper. You're in the wrong direction. It doesn't solve anything. I read Isaiah 30, but I want to read a verse I left out in the passage. So you might as well go to Isaiah 30, look at verses 1 through 3 with me. <clears throat> the principle of typology. Typology has always been one of my favorite subjects in the Word of God because... You know, you study passages and you find out what the dove represents, what this represents, and it makes the Word of God more exciting to me anyway. I hope to many of you. Isaiah 30, verse 1, talks about those who go down to Egypt. Isaiah the prophet says, Woe to the rebellious children! And who are the rebellious children, declares the Lord? Here's those who are rebellious, not who smoke or drink, but those who execute a what? a plan, but not mine. They make an alliance, but not of my spirit, a peace treaty with the world and the people of the world. You go back to your old friends in order to add sin to what? Sin. Who proceed down to typology, the world, the cosmic system, Egypt, without consulting me, they're cut off from fellowship with God. To take refuge, notice, in the safety of Pharaoh, that means to take refuge in Satan as the god of this world. Who seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. They seek protection from the cosmic system. Therefore, the Lord says, here's the result. The safety of Pharaoh will be your shame. And the shelter in the shadow of Egypt will be your, what? Humiliation. That's what I left off on Sunday morning. That we come to a place where we are not humble 
but we're actually humbled. There's a difference between being humble and humbled. Humble means that we recognize who we are and we make decisions in the positive realm and we operate in humility. Being humble means we end up in humiliation. And God teaches us the lesson. And he's going to do it to all of, all of us because in Acts 10.34, he's not a respecter of persons. So going back to Egypt is actually referred to, with the, as the Apostle Paul said in 2 Peter 2.22. He said, and this is a quote from the Proverbs, he said this, It has happened, it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog, what? What's the word? Returns. They're going back to its own vomit and a sow, after washing, may clean themselves up. We're going to see that when it comes to what happens to a house when it cleans itself up. And the Bible says the, even though the spirits are gone, it, the, wor the second state is worse than the first state. That's interesting. That's coming up in the conference in one of my subjects, I believe. It says, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mud, wallowing in the mire. They go back to the scum of this world. Go back to Genesis 12, verse 11. Because we have to see now what happens to Abraham. And unfortunately, ladies, this second half is really dedicated to you. Not in a negative way, but in a positive way. But as a warning as well. In Genesis 12, we begin with verse 11. It came about when he came near to Egypt. Notice Abraham is not in Egypt as, as of yet. He came near to it. That he said to Sarai, his wife, He's not quite in Egypt yet, but he, he's not in quite uh, Egypt yet. But notice again, he's on his way back to Egypt, and what he now proposes is simply very strange, as I mentioned on Sunday, very weird. He says this, see now, <laughs> notice this, I know that you are a beautiful woman. Notice again that satanic attacks, Satan attacks, and satanic attacks actually relate to the woman being beautiful in some way. Being smart in some way. He did that to the woman in the garden. Back to that first mentioned principle in the Garden of Eden. He said again, see now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. However, that's not what he's really thinking. What he's really thinking is something like this. I am self-absorbed and I am arrogant. I don't have any faith in the promises of God. And that God that he just told me a few verses ago. That's what I'm saying. I'm quoting Abraham. I'm thinking like Abraham. I don't think he's going to preserve me long enough to have those promises be fulfilled. And so therefore, I want you to lie for me. That's the thinking of Abraham. Again, he's thinking like this. I'm so self-absorbed. He's not saying this, but this is what he's thinking. You know, that, these are what his thoughts really are. I'm so self-absorbed. I'm arrogant. I don't have any faith in the promises of God that he just told me a few verses ago. And I don't think he's going to preserve me long enough to have those promises be fulfilled. So therefore, I want you to what? I want you to lie for me. Why is he saying that? He's saying that because he's in, unstable. His instability, by the way, this in, the instability in Abraham's life leads to instability in his action and instability where? In the marriage with Sarah. Because once the husband is unstable, it inevitably is going to affect the wife in some particular way. So I'm being facetious when I say what I just said about when he went back to Egypt and he's thinking like that. Of course, I'm, he's not coming right out to say that, but these are really the thoughts that are going through his mind. He says, see now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And notice verse 12, it will come about when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife. And they will what? They will what? Kill me. But they're going to let you live. At this point, he's failing the faith rest life, isn't he? Miserably. And I love it. And you know why? Because at the end of his life, God said something else that is very interesting about him. Because he saw Abraham from a place of his condition. I mean, of, of his position, not his condition. Abram at this point is failing. He's failing the faith rest life miserably. And I love it because at the end of his life, God said something else that is very interesting about him. Because he saw Abraham from his what? Position, not his condition. What did God say? Romans 4.19. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. And he contemplated the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not what? 
waver in unbelief. Did he waver in Genesis 12? Yes, he did. But he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. What's the difference between Genesis 12 and Romans 4? One is about Abraham and his condition, Genesis 12. But the other is about Abraham and his position, Romans 4. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Come on. That's how he deals with us. That's why he said this. I will be merciful to their iniquities. And he has been to mine and to yours. And I will remember their sins. What? No more. God doesn't remember what Abraham did in Genesis 12. It's an anthropopathism. Of course God knows all things. But God is saying, this is how I look at the situation. I see Abraham in his position, not in his condition. I see Alice. I see Bob. I see Mike. I see John. I see Joe. I see Teresa. I see Rick. I see Harry. I see Adrian. I see Robin and Suzanne. I see everyone that's here this evening in their position, not their condition. And that's why I am the God of all grace. That's why I am the God of love. That's why I am the God of mercy. I don't look at people according to their flesh and bring up their mistakes and be critical of them. I look at them according to their spirit. I see them under the mercy and grace of God. I see the forgiveness of sins. I see that. I see my son dying on the cross for every single sin they ever thought, every single sin they ever said, and every single thing they ever did. I see the finished work when the Lord said, Ten and lest I. He said, it is finished in the past. With the result, it goes on being finished for how long? Forever. And so that's the issue. I love that phrase, yet with respect. I love that. With respect to the promise of God, Abraham didn't waver in unbelief. And he didn't. Abram did, but not Abraham, the new man. He grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. What did he do? What really got him through? Two words. Here they are. What really got him through? Right here. He grew what? Strong. Not in faith, I hope so. Well, I hope so. I have faith that maybe God's going to come through. He grew strong in pistis. What is pistis? Doctrine. Eventually, he kept on growing strong because with, he kept on growing strong in doctrine, and when he grew strong in doctrine, what did he do? He gave glory to God. Every time we grow strong in doctrine, we end up not giving glory to ourselves and take advantage of ourselves and say, well, you know what, this is uh, uh, because I'm such a great believer. Every time we give glory to God, it's because we recognize we've done nothing except respond to what he's done for us. So in our passage, Abraham, go back to Genesis 12, is occupied with a person right now, Abraham is occupied with a person in Genesis 12. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not occupied with Christ. He's not occupied with Sarah. He's not occupied with Abraham. I mean, he is occupied with Abram. And God pity a woman, by the way, who dates a man who is occupied with himself. God pity a woman who marries a man who is occupied with himself. God pity a woman who marries a man who is not willing to make a commitment and so don't ever look at these things and say they don't apply. They sure do apply to every single one of us because they were written for our instruction and our examples. Je uh, verse 13, Genesis 12. Please say, he tells now Sarah to lie. He said, please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with who? With me because of you that I may live on account of you. He's putting pressure on his wife. And by the way, this is not the truth. You know what it is? It's a half-truth. Abram is saying, Abram is telling Sarah to lie. It's a half-truth. He can justify it, by the way. This is interesting. Because they did have the same father, but a different mother. Look at Genesis 20. Let me see if I, yeah, you have it. I just want to see if it's close enough to me. Look at Genesis 20, verse 12. What I want you to see, and you've done this, and I've done this at times, and sometimes it's what we call half-truths or half-lies. It wasn't a real lie. There's some truth to it. He said, and by the way, in Genesis 20, this is when Abraham does the very same thing he did in Egypt with Pharaoh. He repeats the sin. And he's now going to repeat it with a king called Abimelech. And in Genesis uh, chapter 20, notice what it says in verse uh, 11. Abram said, uh, when, well, Abimelech said to Abram, verse 10, what, what have you 
encountered. What have you, why have you done this thing? He found out that uh, uh, Sarah was his wife. Abraham said, because I thought, surely, there's no respect of God in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, look what he says in verse 12. She actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So what's he saying? It's a half true. She's not really my wife. She's my sister. They did have the same father, but they had a different mother. We know that because, again, when he fails with the king Abimelech at the king of Gerah, he says what I just said. Sarah is actually my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. She became my wife. He's using the current day believer logic, saying this is not really a lie, a complete lie. We're not really lying. It's not really a sin. It's interesting that up to this day, Egypt, as I said, is still a problem for Israel and a problem for Abraham's descendants. And uh, we are, by the way, when I say Israel is still a problem, I mean uh, uh, Egypt is still a problem for Israel and a problem for his descendants, you should say amen. You know why? We are his descendants, aren't we? Okay. Is Egypt a problem for us today? Yes, it is. Not the literal place, but under typology, what does Egypt represent? The cosmic system. And the cosmic system is a problem for all, all of us. And that is why nations that are against the physical seed of Abraham, the Jews, are also against the spiritual seed of Abraham, the Christians, in Galatians 3, verse 7. And I want you to see this because this is a passage that we did not see. We saw Gen Galatians 3, but we didn't say, uh, see Galatians 4. But go to Galatians 3 for a moment. Look at verse 7 and see the relationship that we have because of Abraham, and to this day, some of the mistakes he made actually hinder us, just like some of the decisions that he made prosper us. But notice again in your study, Galatians, and in your notes, you should have this. Galatians 3, verse 7 says, Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of who? Abraham. Now, are you of faith? Yes, you are. Then are you a son of Abraham? Absolutely. Look at verse 22 of chapter 4. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now we're going to talk about the two, Isaac and Ishmael. One by the bondwoman. Who's that? That's Hagar. He had, she had, they had Ishmael. One by the free woman. There we have it. The Arab and a Jew. One by the bondwoman, Ishmael, the Arab one. And one by a Jew, Sarah, the Jewish one. The promised one. But the son by the bondwoman, the son by the bondwoman, Hagar, was born according to the what? Flesh. That means they were, she was, they were born, uh, uh, Ishmael was born according to human power, human viewpoint, on the, po on the part of both Abraham and Sarah and even Hagar. So notice again, the son of the bondwoman, we're back to uh, typology, was born according to the flesh, according to human power, human viewpoint. And the son by the free woman, Sarah and Isaac, came through the promise. This is typology. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants. Hagar and Sarah represent two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, the law, bearing children, who are to be what? Slaves. The law puts us under slavery. She is who? Hagar, the Arab. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai. That means she's under the law in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of this earth, for she is in slavery, slavery with her children. But the true Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above, is what? Free. She is the one that's our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Rejoice, Sarah. Break forth and shout. You who are not in labor, you're not in labor now, for more are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of what? Promise. But at this time, he who was born according to the flesh, the Arab, persecutes him who was born according to the spirit, the Jew. So it is now what? Also. Now, do the Arabs attack the Jews? Yes. Are the Jews the descendants of Abraham? Yes. Do the Arabs attack the Jews because the Jews are descendants of Abraham? Yes. Then the Arabs attack us because who are we? Descendants of Abraham. That's why we are called the great Satan. 
The Jews are cons Israel is considered the little Satan. The USA is considered to be the great Satan. So as we've noted, and pardon me for repeating, this is the evil behind the religion that has attacked us here in the United States and which has been attacking Israel for decades. This is why as believers and as a nation, we need to understand the root of the problem in the Middle East is not just with the Muslims and Islam. It, 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 it actually started with that, but it even goes on uh, uh, beyond that. Because not only are we under attack by jihad, holy war, and radical Muslims, but we're also getting slowly and surely dragged into another what we call world war. I hope you realize we're on the verge of World War III. It's not too far away. And even added to that, Satan did what, what Satan is doing right now to the United States, what he did with Rome, who was a client nation at that particular time when the client nations existed after the Lord Jesus Christ died and the church age began. We are on the verge of what happened to, in Rome. You know what happened in Rome that really broke it down? Rome wasn't defeated from without. It was defeated from within. And what do you think is being ha what do you think is happening right now with the police officers? What do you think is happening right now with the we have a civil war trying to be developed by Satan and the god of this world, the cosmic system, trying to get uh, minorities against the whites, trying to sow discord. The only hope is, I believe, is the pivot growing in God's grace and knowledge. So the point again is we need to know and recognize our enemy. And here's where I want to close with because there are some similar signs of what happened when Rome, in Rome, and what is happening in the United States, which are really shocking today, if you desire to know these. I'm going to give you a list of 10 principles. And these are quick principles, so you don't have to uh, be concerned that there's only nine minutes left. But the following is a list of what happened to Rome as a client nation and what's happening to client nation USA today. Number one, there was in Rome staggering misuse of funds. Is that happening in our country? Absolutely. Number two, an increase in civil disobedience. Every day we're hearing about civil disobedience, some officers being shot. The, the establishment is being broke down. The four laws, remember, freedom, number one, marriage, number two, family, number three, patriotism, number four, all under attack. They were under attack in Rome, they're under attack today. Number three, destruction of the middle class. That's happening in our country right now. A separation is beginning to develop between those who are poor and those who are really rich, and the middle class is now under so much tax, uh, uh, tax, uh, pressure that they are no longer be able to become middle class any longer because the government is overtaxing them. The middle class is actually trying to be destroyed by Satan as he did in Rome. He's trying to do in the USA. Number four, if you do this, this is really good. There was the evil campaign funding sources in Rome. And by the way, it's happening today where an individual can speak and get two million dollars and the individual gets that because they were involved in politics and perform so much evil that they're being rewarded for the evil that they perform. Evil campaign fun funding sources are around today. Number five, we are told that politics in Rome is the same thing as politics in our day and age. age. It's used as a road to personal wealth. Politicians will tell you they don't make money in the White House. They don't even make, I believe, $300,000. I think it's under $300,000. They make all their money after when they can go from college to college, liberal colleges especially, use the media, use Wall Street, use uh, you know, the, uh, the places that want to promote their books, and they can do that for the sake of personal wealth. Number six, there's also, it happened in Rome, it's happening today, continuous wars. Do you realize we don't recognize this because of the generation that we're in, but let's take, for example, the United States for the past 100 years, it, we have either been fighting a war or recovering from, uh, uh, recovering from a war. For example, we have World War I, 1917 to 1918. World War II, 1941 to 45. The Cold War, 47 to 90, 1991. Korean War, 1950 to 1953. Vietnam, 1953 to 1975. The Gulf War, 1990 to 1991. Afghanistan, 2001 and still ongoing. And Iraq, 2003, 2011. And what's going on in the Middle East? What did the Bible say about the last days? There will be wars and what? Rumors of wars, we're seeing it. 
And yet people say, well, these don't exist. But let me tell you something. There's a tremendous analogy between what happened to Rome and what's happening to us. We'll see more of this even during the conference. Number seven, there's the deception and lies from the fourth estate. It happened in Rome. In fact, Caesar had to deal with it. Even Caesar did. A deception and lies that comes from the media. Number eight, the control of lobbyists over our nation's capital. Happened in Rome, happened in today. Number nine, you might also like profits made overseas by our current, our current over our government officials. We make more money overseas, our politicians do, by actually telling them what's going on in America. The same thing happened in Rome when it spread out throughout the entire world and they ended up putting down Caesar and his authority. And then number 10, reducing the power of common citizens. And by the way, is our power being reduced? How much does our vote really count any longer? Because we find all kinds of ungodliness, all kinds of evil, and yet what we're seeing, again, is what Hegel said, what we've learned from history is that we don't learn from history at all. We just repeat what history has done. But be careful, and here's how you know a nation is going down, and I'll leave you with this, and I'm not saying a nation is going down as of yet, but it's on the road to doing so, if not already there. Be careful when there's a breakdown with these four laws of establishment. People's freedom is being taken away. Every day our freedom is being taken away. Whether it's going through a line at the airport for our own convenience or our own protection, et cetera, believe what you want. No matter what it is, you have to have a number, your social security number. They know now through the internet what you buy, what you sell, what you uh, actually believe in. Your freedom is actually being taken away. Number two, marriage, totally destroyed where homosexuality and lesbianism and being married as a homosexual or lesbian is accepted. Happened in Rome, it's happening to us. Three, because of the marriage being destroyed, you're gonna have the family. And then number four, we're patriotism. Instead of being patriots to our nation, we want internationalism. Let's just have the whole world together. Let's bring unity. Why? So that the God of this world, Satan, can take over in that one place, which I'm gonna show you, I believe, my personal belief, that one place will be in Jerusalem and it will not be from a pope. It's going to be, I believe, from a Jew. And I'm going to establish that during the conference coming up. So these are exciting times, aren't they? I know I've given you a lot of information that I've studied. But I've studied a lot of this in detail, but trust me on this. And if you have any questions, that's what will happen during the conference where we'll have a tremendous time of Q&A period for you to ask any questions that you may have. But I'm quite excited about what's going on. I hope that many of you are as well, because I believe that with all my heart and soul, as someone told me this, uh, this evening, this could be the last conference we ever have. I believe he is coming back. Father, thank you again for the power of your word. Thank you that you've given us the ability to grow in your grace and knowledge. Challenge us with what we've heard this evening. Bless each person that came. Let them see how grateful we are and how that book of remembrance has been written every time we gather together, whether it's face-to-face -face or non-face-to-face, -face, that book of remembrance is written and our name will be in it. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our congregation. Thank you for this local assembly. And thank you for the worldwide ministry we have. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.